videos. Right? Like shorter videos. But you know, we get sometimes 200 views. I was just wondering if I should like share the link with someone I know that might be. Definitely. Speaking of which, um, I don't know what you do. I did not rust you. Tom, today. Oh. He gave me the proof at three. Can you show up? It's on the tent. Okay. Maybe grab some food and then we get started. Okay. 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 So let's get uh, started. Let me remind you of the uh, events in the coming uh, days. On Tuesday, Sandy Mitchell is uh, giving a talk at noon here, the lunch, the noon, uh, lunchtime talk on the variable sinness of being a pragmatist metaphysics of affordances. On Friday, Christian Spencer from Penn is giving uh, an ALS lecture on the 10th floor at 3.30 uh, p.m. Over the weekend next week, there is a PAX conference, which uh, brings together exponential philosophy and formal philosophy on uh, Saturday and Sunday. The program is online at last. So if you want to know more about the program, go to the, uh, the center website and you'll find information about it. Um, I think that's it for the uh, events in the coming days. Today, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Stan Dawitsky, who uh, is coming often to Pittsburgh, uh, I understood, but we never had the opportunity to bring him to the center. Uh, so I'm actually very happy we were able to do that this, this year. And, we, and I hope we'll be able to do that again in, in, in the future. In fact, um, uh, that is of cognitive science and uh, works on issues related, mostly works on issues related to a uh, theory of mind and mind uh, reading. He has published a very influential book called uh, Mind Shaping, 
which was actually a totally new tech on um, uh, I highly recommend that book, the very original understanding of um, uh, uh, mind reading. But it's published on all sorts of things in the area on, uh, um, um, self, on self cognition, on issues, and on other issues related to, uh, to, mind, to mind reading. And today, uh, that's going to be talking about pattern finding and pattern making. If you want to know more about his long list of publication, uh, go to his uh, website, uh, which is right there. And that's actually uh, his CV, actually, on the website. Yes, that's something that's there. That's right. Well, thank you so much, Edward. Uh, it has, I have indeed been coming here for many years, and I'm happy I'm finally able to join you all for a storied program. <laughs> um, and uh, so today, I'm going to introduce you to uh, a very early work in progress. I've started thinking around uh, these issues quite recently. I've given versions of this talk at a uh, couple workshops, one in Ireland, and one in Birmingham, UK, but the audience there weren't philosophers. And then I gave a, 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 a sort of practice run to my own department last Friday. So I've been tweaking it. Um, so I'm really, you know, uh, looking forward to your feedback. I think this project has legs, but I'm not sure because, you know, the two main things it's about, which is ideology and active inference, I'm kind of a novice at both of those. So any help you could give me, I'm, I'd like to take it. So uh, let's talk, uh, oh, that went too far fast. Okay. Uh, sorry, just giving you a little bit of a back view here. Why is this happening? Goodness. Okay, so here, the background and plan. So um, so what I want to propose here is an initial stab of what I'm, you might call the cognitive neuroscience of ideology. And uh, there's going to be a bit of a, as you saw with my little impromptu preview, it's going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour through intellectual history. So bear with me. But the basic idea is this. On our traditional understanding of cognition, the cognitive processes driving pattern finding um, are different, distinct from the cognitive processes driving pattern making, what I call pattern finding, pattern making. I'll talk, I'll say more what I mean by those terms in a sec. And for me, this the problem, ideology raises an interesting problem uh, for this uh, sort of bifurcation, because as I understand ideology, following uh, mainly people like Sally Haslanger, is that um, ideology is precisely uh, a very important kind of pattern making in which in, uh, humans engage, but it relies essentially on beliefs, assertions, which are apparently aimed at pattern finding that make themselves true. So it's my, the motivation for the project is it's very hard to fit ideological thoughts, ideological utterances into this dichotomy, this traditional dichotomy between uh, say beliefs, um, assertions, uh, intentions, desires, and commands on the other side, these, these, this traditional dichotomy. What I want to urge in this talk is that this newly emerging paradigm in modeling a cognitive, uh, in cognitive neuroscience, active inference, is ideally suited, actually, to explain uh, the, the sort of two Janus-faced nature of ideology. Um, and But they have focused, the people who do this, including my PhD advisor, Andy Clark, from way back when, um, they focus mainly on individual pattern making, you know, how um, uh, active inference can explain individual behavior, but ideologies make themselves through, through social pattern making. So what I'm going to talk about towards the end of my talk is how we can adapt the sort of active inference paradigm to the, the case of making social patterns. All right, onward. So what... Why is this happening? Sorry, <laughs> maybe I'll just go down here. All right, does that work? Yeah. So this, uh, this is sort of, to give you an intuitive idea of what I mean by pattern finding, the paradigms of found patterns are scientific laws, you know, well-confirmed scientific laws or things like the golden ratio, um, which are uh, sort of observed in the data and our models come to reflect them uh, when we learn about them. So those are found patterns. And the sort of paradigms of made patterns are things like you know, the Aculean hand axe, one of the most exquisite examples of a made pattern and earliest uh, examples of a, a human made pattern, 
or you know a Bach toccata or uh, uh, various written languages like as uh, in the Rosetta Stone, military marching, sadly very appropriate these days, architecture, various forms of dance and so forth. These are the sort of paradigms of found patterns and made patterns. And you know, as is the case with a lot of intuitive distinctions, Aristotle noticed it and systematized it. And what he said very famously is that there are different forms of cognitive processing underlining, underlying these different forms of human activity. Theoria is aimed at finding patterns. Uh, praxis is aimed at making patterns in human behavior, right? Uh, rational action. Um, and poesis is aimed at making patterns out of material objects, technology, art, and so forth. And he even identified different forms of reasoning involved in these in these different activities, theoretical and practical, uh, the theoretical and the practical syllogism. This has had a huge influence in Western philosophy, most notably if you look at mid 20th century philosophy of language, you have the example of Elizabeth Anscombe's famous example of the grocery list. If you are using the grocery list uh, to find groceries, you're, you're engaged in pattern making, uh, I would put it, it's an imperative act. But you can use the same grocery list um, to find a pattern as if you are um, a private detective following around the grocery shopper and listing what they purchase, right? And this has been adapted, uh, you know, very fruitfully by Searle in his theory of speech acts and in taxonomizing speech acts in terms of direction of fit. So the uh, uh, pattern finding speech acts assertions mainly have a, a word to world direction of fit, meaning that, you know, if the world and the word are at odds with each other. The norm is you have to change the word to match the world, vice versa for imperative speech acts. This has also had an enormous influence in philosophy of mind and cognitive science. So, oh, sorry. Why am I having such trouble with this? I don't understand. Have you tried arrows? No? Yeah. That I, I did that last time and I got like 10 <laughs> slides ahead. I went in a warp drive. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, so this is a uh, picture from a book by Peter Carruthers, you know, arguably one of the foremost humans about the mind these days. But anyways, classic sort of boxology diagram where the desire module and the belief module is dis disjoint. And if you want to make a behavior through practical reason, you need input from the desire module. If you want to make a belief, um, you, you sort of get input from the world. And this is a human idea, the idea that all human action is a product of cognition and cognition. You can't get the, a sort of direct action out of just cognitive states. It has to be coupled with a completely separate uh, a state, which is produced by a completely separate stream in the mind, uh, the desire uh, to, to yield action. So, okay, that's the classic view. Now, my advisor, Andy Clark, has been arguing for a number of years now, going back to his book, Surfing on Certainty 2016, most recently, the paper in the Australasian Journal of Philosophy from a couple of years ago. He's been arguing the brain doesn't work that way. So that's his argument. He's like, the tradition's got it wrong. The brain doesn't work that way. And what I'll say more about the, the alternative he argues for, but this is from the abstract to this paper. Desires and motivations are fluently accommodated within the unifying predictive processing schema, where they emerge as webs of prior beliefs that sculpt probabilistic predictions, some of which become positioned so as to bring about actions. Importantly, a single construct here plays the role of belief and desire. I love this debate. I'm sympathetic to this view, but my argument in this paper is not does not turn on how the brain actually ends up working. I'm going to start. I want to look at a much higher level phenomenon. What one might say a phenomenon from sociology, not from neuroscience and argue that if this model of the brain is correct, it provides a very nice explanation of this sociological phenomenon. And the sociological phenomenon I have in mind is ideology. So these are some of the great granddaddies of the notion of ideology. The French philosopher Paul Ricoeur uh, referred to these, to Marx, Foucault, Freud, and Nietzsche as philosophers of suspicion because they, um, th they assume, they argue that a lot of the things we take for granted as being true of the world, we should be suspicious about, that there are uh, underlying factors which um, um, uh, kind of uh, 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 support, systematically support the misrepresentation of reality, basically, uh, in terms of these dogmas or ideologies. 
what I want to focus on, uh, I mean, there's a lot, here's an area I'm, I'm, I'm woefully underread in, but one feature of ideology that I find fascinating, at least according to some people, is that it's pattern making masquerading as pattern finding. That would be my slogan. So we, we find a pattern in gender roles. We find a pattern in racial, uh, racial uh, tendencies towards criminal behavior. And we think of this as a pattern we have found when it's actually a pattern we've made. And what makes these patterns, th this thing so insidious is that the pattern making relies on us thinking of it as pattern finding, right? So the, the idea that we think of, that we are discovering truths of <laughs> nature plays a role in making these patterns more resilient, more robust in, 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 in perpetuating, right? The, so that's what I have in mind. So, uh, you know, if you look at uh, standard uh, explanations of ideology, the idea is, the basic idea is you promote the interests of, of the powerful by concealing the true patterns, right? But with masking patterns, victims unwittingly work to reproduce at least partially. So, you know, Marx pointed out that these, Christian slogans like the meek shall inherit the earth uh, do not reflect a reality, are not, are not finding a pattern. They are a made pattern uh, used to conceal what's actually happening, which is the powerful uh, um, uh, keeping these people in, in chains, right? You know, the notion of biopower and Foucault and, and the idea of using bio claims about biologically natural tendencies to reinforce certain power relations. It's only natural for men to desire women, for example, seems masquerades as a found pattern, works, however, to make a pattern or reinforce a pattern. Freud, you know, future evolution, God will redeem our suffering. Um, it's, you know, reinforces a pattern of behavior by in virtue of the fact that people think of it as a pattern that's natural without there in the world. So that's sort of how ideology functions. I mean, there's a lot more to ideology. Of course, a few things have been written about as much as that as this. For my purposes, this is the sort of property of ideology I want to focus on. Okay, uh, moving on. So just to give you some idea, some reasons to think that this, the ideology is a pretty pervasive. One source is Sally Haslanger's book, Resisting Reality. Why resisting reality? How, how can you resist reality? Well, this duality makes sense of the title, the duality I've been talking about, right? These patterns um, regarding race and gender are real, right? But they are constructed. They're not natural, but their construction is involves the assumption that they're natural. That's what's really interesting about them. So, um, she writes that a lot of this, this, these kinds of patterns are reinforced not through deliberate structural institutional forms of oppression, but because they are internalized in our basic interpretations and understandings of our bodies, ourselves, and each other. In other words, we take these patterns to be found when it's actually that they're made in virtue of us taking them to be found partially at least, right? Now, why, why are these patterns which are so, um, you know, which ultimately are not grounded in anything natural. Why do they persist so long? Well, a really fascinating recent theory about this that I'm going to just briefly mention is Kaylin O'Connor's amazing recent book, uh, Social Categories and Cultural Evolution. Kaylin O'Connor is a student of Brian Skirms at the University of California, Riverside. And she has used the game theoretic, uh, evolutionary game theory techniques of modeling the evolution of populations to model um, the uh, emergence of uh, asymmetric divisions of labor, for example, uh, gendered asymmetric divisions of labor. And uh, so she begins by pointing out this really interesting distinction between correlative and, co and complementary coordination problems. So, a correlative coordination problem is one where both agents involved in the coordination have to perform the same action to succeed. So driving on the right is, your, is a classic example of a correlative coordination problem. But if you do a complementary coordination problem, these are the ones where the partners have to do different things for the coordination to succeed. So dance is a classic example, the Paso Doble, if both partners did the same thing, that would be a disaster, right? So they have to do different things. They complement each other. 
she uses this concept to model gendered solutions to, for example, household division of labor problem. There's a lot of sociological data that, you know, in any population, no matter how explicitly committed to gender equity, you always end up having asymmetric uh, division of labor when it comes to household, almost always, right? Um, and it's the female who ends up doing more of the household uh, work. So the idea, the basic idea behind the book is that if you run these simulations, these models of the uh, emergence of these complementary coordination problems, very often it takes small initial conditions for an asymmetric solution to emerge. And once an asymmetric solution emerges, right, it's an e a stable equilibrium strategy, which means the, not playing the disadvantaged role has greater costs than playing it, right? So even though you're disadvantaged as a woman in, in gender division of labor, not doing the, your part in that division makes you even more disadvantaged, right? Uh, relative to your preferences. You want to keep the family together. You want the kids to go to school, whatever, right? Um, so uh, O'Connor thinks this, this kind of, this is sort of inherent to the dynamics of this. And she thinks you need constant political vigilance to prevent this because it's, it's a kind of natural outcome of the dynamics of these um, uh, evolved equilibria. Okay, it, so it explains the evident gender asymmetries across cultures, but she also notes on a hopeful note that there's a lot of variation in gender division of labor across cultures, which suggests there are interventions, that there are contingent socio historical and political factors which explain the particular gender divisions of labor that, that we encounter. But still, they're extremely difficult to dislodge. So this sort of explains why ideologies are so important in human experience, right? They're not just sort of um, uh, uh, idle thoughts. They, they play a role in coordination. And that's why they're so difficult to dislodge. Another sort of source for you know, the importance of this is uh, Ian Hacking's uh, notion of the looping effects in, of humankind's in, in, in the, he focuses on psychiatry, but it's supposed to uh, involve the categorization of any human behavior, right? He calls this dynamic nominalism. And it's a, it's a really interesting term because the idea is, you know, often when we deploy a category to classify human beings, there's no real essence there. However, because human beings think of themselves as being categorized by the category, right? The, the act of labeling actually creates these categories in a dynamic way because the categories become unstable because the way that the people being categorized interpret the categories changes their behavior, which requires further uh, altering of the categories in this sort of never ending loop. And you know, this is shown in multiple personality the way his classic case in this book is how multiple personality disorder was sort of had been, when he wrote this book, it was just beginning to be reclassified as dissociative identity disorder in response to how people were reacting to being classified as having multiple personality disorder, right? That's part of his point. But we've seen this happen throughout, right? So homosexuality uh, used to be a, a category of pathology, turns into a social identity. Uh, most recently in DS, latest DSM, the autism Asperger's distinction has just yielded a spectrum. Um, and you know, mental illness more broadly is now being reconceptualized as neurodiversity. So this phenomenon is all over the place. A really funny story about Ian Hacking, I don't know if you, you may have come across this because it's in his, he writes about it, but he had thought that you know, for multiple personality, you're never gonna get the dynamic that you got in homosexuality where you had like, it became a social identity and they were like gay bars and all that. But then he's like, but I just came out of my first dissociative identity bar. Apparently <laughs> somewhere in Colorado, they had like a bar for people with dissociative identity. It became a social identity, right? So anyways, this just shows that assumptions about, you know, human nature have these weird unstable effects because they're, they're not just pattern finding, they're also making patterns, right? Because, why? Because people know they're being classified, right? You can't get a looping effect with, you know, um, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of a mineral here, uh, <laughs> calcium or something. Again, you know, calcium doesn't know it's being classified as calcium. So it's not gonna go into a looping uh, effect with classification. But when it comes to human kinds, it's different. Okay. so. Final bit of evidence that you know ideologies matter. This is a new paper coming out by Uwe Peters in the British Journal of Philosophy and Science, 
he just pointed out that there's all this interesting evidence that descriptive norms routinely have self-fulfilling effects, right? So not prescriptive norms, not you should do this, you should do that. Just describing the category you're a member of will trigger in you conformist behavior and conformist be, uh, uh, direction. So, you know, here's some classic examples, especially when it's disseminated. I mean, the point of the paper is largely about responsibility in science journalism and how we have to be very careful in how we disseminate information about descriptive norms uh, using human categories because they have these crazy uh, self-fulfilling effects. But here's some examples from uh, the popular press or, you know, popular characterizations, you know, men resist green behaviors unmanly. Americans eat too much processed meat. Britons are uniquely reluctant to wear COVID-19 masks. But if you look at the, the data, so this is a sort of a, a study by Schultz, California households informed that they use more electricity than all the other households in their neighborhood subsequently reduced their energy consumption. Uh, whereas households informed they use less increased it. And this isn't a one-off. According to uh, Peters, there's a, a meta study um, Melnick and all meta analysis, descriptive norms directly influence behavior, not only intention formation and their effect on behavior is generally stronger than that of prescriptive norms. So, another weird thing are you finding a pattern here or are you making one? Okay. So, one philosopher has talked about this, and that's Ruth Garrett Milliken a long time ago, 1995. She coined, you know, inspired by this creature from Dr. Doolittle, the two-headed, I don't know, gazelle or something, I'm not sure, uh, called the push me pull you. Um, uh, she said there are these acts, these um, mental states and also a, uh, linguistic acts, which she called push me pull you representations. What a woman does, what a teacher does, how one behaves when one is married and when one is chair of the meeting. These are grasped via thoughts, push me pull you representations that simultaneously describe and prescribe. Another one she gave is, we don't eat peas with our fingers. But in recent uh, news, one thing that uh, struck me is that in politically fraught situations like wars or political campaigns, this stuff is all over the place. You know, this is Blinken in March. There was no way, we still don't know if this is true. If this is tracking a real pattern. Um, uh, but definitely in March, there was no way of knowing this was true, but he sort of asserts confidently when all is said and done, an independent Ukraine will be there, and at some point Vladimir Putin will not. Why? Why does he assert stuff for which there's zero evidence? Obviously, he's trying to make a pattern. He's trying to make a pattern, but he's using a linguistic act which is designed for, or supposed to be, tracking a pattern. Why? Well, that really makes it a lot better at making patterns, <laughs> you know? That, so that, that's the example. Okay, so now I'm gonna bring in active inference. Okay, so there's been this revolution amongst, in some quarters anyway, in how, understanding what the brain does. And um, uh, predictive processing, sometimes called the Bayesian brain, it starts with Bayes rule and it basically just says, you know, you start with a prior belief about the world, you've got a model of how the world, world works. Um, and then you generate from that a prediction or a set of predictions. And the prediction, which is you know best confirmed by the data that is then used to alter your prior beliefs for the next round and or alter the, your model of the world. So, but the basic idea behind this whole new approach is that there's really just one um, uh, imperative that the brain pursues at multiple scales. Uh, everything from the lowest level sensory, sensory motor scales to long-term planning to even sort of uh, theoretical reasoning in science. And that is to minimize the difference between old information, which is stored in your model of the world, and new information, which is stimulating your sense. That's all the brain does. Okay, why do I think this is relevant to the problem of ideology? Here's the godfather of active inference. Um, Carl Friston, he's a third author on this new book, which is a great book, by the way, I, I recently read it, but in the preface, he says, I didn't write any of the book. <laughs> he just wanted me to be one of the authors on it. I just wrote the preface, but apparently that's pretty common for Friston. He gets like co-authored, roped into co-authoring a lot of stuff when it's actually other people. So it's, it's really Parr and Sulo doing uh, most of the work in this book, but here's what they write. 
Under active inference, perception and action are two complementary ways to fulfill the same imperative, minimization of free energy. Free energy is a technical concept, roughly stands in for surprise or discrepancy between your expectation and, 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 and the actual um, data, right? So perception minimizes free energy and surprise by Bayesian belief updating or changing your mind, thus making your beliefs compatible with sensory observation. Instead, action minim minimizes free energy and surprise by changing the world to make it compatible with your beliefs and goals. This unification of cognitive functions marks a fundamental difference between active inference and other approaches that treat action and perception in isolation from one another. So here's a nice diagram from the book that really sort of brings this out. You make a prediction about the world and then you make an observation and you, often there's a discrepancy. Then you have a choice. You can either um, change your beliefs or you could change the world to minimize the discrepancy. And what the brain's gonna do on different occasions and in different contexts depends on really fine-grained contextual details about the task. Sometimes the best way to minimize the discrepancy will be to update your expectations for the next round. Other times it'll be to change the world to match your, your current expectation. <clears throat> So here is one of the sort of another um, sort of pioneer in this in using this uh, to address philosophy of mind, Jakob Howey. Uh, here's his explanation of action as self-fulfilled predictions. The representations of predicted sensory inputs change how sensory input would change if the system were to act a certain way. Given that things are not actually that way, a prediction error is induced which can be minimized by acting in the prescribed way. The mechanism for being a system that acts is as nothing more than the generation of prediction error and the ability to change the body's configuration such the antecedent of the counterfactual actually obtains an error is suppressed. Action therefore does not come about through some complex computation of motor commands that control the muscles in the body. Instead, the muscles are told to move as long as there is prediction error. The muscles are at the mercy of prediction error generated by the brain's model of the way the world is expected to be like, but isn't. Okay. Um, so, given this, um, how let's I'm going to talk a little bit more about the sort of details of this model. This is important. One way of one slogan that I think captures the idea here is counterfactual expectation perseveration. When it comes to action, it's actually counterfactual expectation, proprioceptive expectation, perseveration. Okay, so you have expectations, if you wanna raise your arm about how it will feel for your arm to be where you want it to be, right? You have an expectation about that. And, but your arm isn't there yet. So if you just updated the model, you'd never move, right? So what happens is for some reason, this expectation, which is counterfactual, gets preserved, it's sticky, it doesn't change despite not tracking the way the world is. And the only way to minimize discrepancy then is through a pattern of reflex arc stimulations, which make your arm move up and match the expectation, right? So some expectations, so they think, for example, people who advocate this view, they think, for example, expectations that your nutri nutrient uh, intake will be sufficient, expectation that your body temperature will be in a certain range, expectations necessary for survival are like the ultimate sticky expectations, right? As soon as there's a departure from those expectations, you don't revise the expectation. That, uh, that, that road, that way lies death, certain death, right? You, the expectation remains, and instead what gets revised is the world that it's tracking, right? So, but what makes them sticky? What, how do you explain the stickiness of some expectation? Well, here's Andy Clark. Bringing about action requires attenuating, that is, assigning a low precision to sensory information, currently indexing the actual disposition of the body, so as to enable precise proprioceptive predictions corresponding to some desired trajectory to prevail. Intentional action thus depends upon a delicate balance that combines precise proprioceptive predictions with attenuated information concerning current bodily states, an interesting consequence is that action thus depends on a kind of systematic misrepresentation. Notice how similar that is to ideology. Systematic misrepresentation of how our body is currently arrayed in space. So the idea is that it's, it's part and parcel of predictive processing models that the brain learns not just the statistics of the uh, external environment, 
but also how reliable its own sources of evidence are, right, in different contexts. And it assigns low precision to sources of evidence which it has found to be unreliable. So that's sort of a general idea from predictive processing. What the active inference folks like Friston have done is they've taken that and used it to explain action. So when you're initiating an action, you assign low precision to the current proprioceptive feedback you're getting. And for that reason, it does not update the expectation that your arm will be up here. But the discrepancy remains, and the only way left for you to minimize the discrepancy is by moving your arm. That's the way, that's as I understand it, and as, as I say, I'm kind of a novice to this literature, but that's the way I understand it. Okay, so what lessons can we take for that to pattern making and pattern finding more generally? Well, here is the classical view again. For any cognitive act and any linguistic act, we can put it in one of two categories. There's a fact of the matter as to whether it's a word to world direction of fit um, act where it's aiming to tell you what the world is like. And that maps onto the values true or false, or it's a world to word direction of fit. And that maps onto the values fulfilled or unfulfilled. Here we have desires and intentions, and some of them might be clothed in assertive acts, but they actually function as intentions or desires, you know, men, women act. Thus, life has meaning and so forth, right? If, you're, if you buy Milliken, you can add a th third bucket. You can add a third bucket, which is the push me, pull you representation bucket. And some things will go in that bucket, right? But the cool thing I wanna suggest to you for active inference is you can replace this with a range of possibilities, a space of possibilities. And any token cognitive act falls somewhere in this space, right? based on the degree of expectation perseveration, how sticky it is in response to confuting evidence and the degree of error. And so different cognitive acts like diet doesn't impact health. That thing isn't too sticky. That thing tends to be uh, revised if there's high error, right? And it, this, this particular assertion would have high error. Diet does impact health, right? So that would be over there, right? But you take something like life has meaning, I don't know. In my experience, it's pretty high, it stays pretty high on the error thing. <laughs> However, it's extremely sticky, right? Okay, and, and then you, you can place other sort of cognitive acts elsewhere in the space. The cool thing about this, so active inference gives us a way of doing this, right? Of seeing the um, distinction between making patterns and finding patterns as a, uh, a, con a continuum, right? Um, and the cool thing is that the same cognitive act can on different, occasions in the same individual fall different places on this space, depending on the context. And across individuals, it could fall in different places in the space, right? That would be very hard to capture, I think, in the old view where it, you know, the type, the cognitive type has to fall into one bucket or another bucket, right? And this is what's so powerful about ideology, is that stuff that sometimes functions less ideologically in other contexts can function very ideologically, same cognitive state, but because all the brain cares about is discrepancy reduction in different contexts, discrepancy reduction will take different forms, okay? So that's why I like active inference as a way of understanding the dynamics of ideology. But so far, I've talked only about, you know, individual action and ideologies are really most effective on the social level. So how do we translate this into the social level? And this is where I'm sort of, I'm trying to figure things out. I think it fits with my earlier work on mind shaping. Um, some possible mechanisms, I think, where uh, where I think are um, we have sticky expectations about the social world, and some mechanism by which we alter the social world to to match our expectations. One is identification. So fans, uh, a classic case is fans identifying with their sports team. You know, if you, I'm not that into sports, but one team I will always identify with is the Montreal Canadiens. And you know, when they're playing and I'm wanting to, and they're taking a shot, I'm like this, you know, I'm like, why did you take the shot? Um, <laughs> you know, another good example is my son with whom of course you, you, it's hard not to, you know, Freud taught us, it's very hard not to identify with offspring and vice versa. But anyways, the once I took him up uh, to a, a slide, you know, water slide park, the ricketyest little, scaffold I have ever been on in my life. And I have terrible high anxiety. I'm like terrible, 
But Anton, he doesn't care, right? So he's just like leaning out. And I'm like, oh, you know, you've had that experience, right? When someone close to you, if you're scared of heights, someone close to you, it's almost scarier to see them in peril than, than yourself, right? So you're kind of identifying with them and you're thrown into a motivational state that's relevant to them, not to you, right? Uh, which is weird. So there's a possible mechanism whereby you got sort of pattern making being extended beyond your body to, to someone else's. Another one, I think Strassen's notion of reactive attitudes, right? So someone cuts you off in on in traffic right and you're like you don't sort of adjust your expectations about humans dispassionately and say oh well i guess people sometimes cut you off in traffic no you sort of mf -er, you know you're like you get really pissed right you have a reactive that i want to say might be a sort of pattern making response um to discrepancy reduction right um relative to the norm that people follow traffic rules um Motor, there might be even very low level things. So when you have dancing or marching, especially, uh, you've got like motor resonance or behavioral synchrony. There's all sorts of people who do stuff on how rhythms get reproduced automatically when people are striking a drum or something like that. And I think a lot of this is sort of, can be brought under the umbrella of this notion of social niche construction. So um, it's Ken or Kevin Leyland. Uh, anyway, Leyland from back, back way back when has this notion of niche construction in philosophy of biology, where bio, you know organisms often construct their niche uh, to a better fit for their current dispositions rather than adapting the, the niche. But and people have brought this into the social world and tried to understand culture in these ways, where culture uh, is is a way of constructing a social niche uh, for yourself. So these are some possible mechanisms. I've got a recent paper in. Um, uh, synthes, which terms all this stuff sociocognitive tools. And uh, I'm kind of riffing off of Dennett's notion of a cognitive tool. And for Dennett, uh, you know, Arabic numerals is a cognitive tool. Uh, there, he focuses on non-social cases. And, 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 for, and those are, those help you become a better cognitive agent. From, from the neat thing about sociocognitive tools is they also make you, they make you not only a better cognitive agent, they make you a better cognitive object. Right. So when you learn English as a child, um, you don't only become better able to interpret others' behavior, they become better able to interpret your behavior at the same time. So sociocognitive tools have this nice to um, um, Janus face property where they change you as much as they change uh, your capacity to predict others. Another good example I get from Victoria McGeer is learning a game, learning to play chess or cricket, right? You learn this way of interpreting behavior which you hadn't had before, but you also become, when you play, much easier to interpret by other players, right? So um, so I, so I, the idea here is that to use that notion in conjunction with active inference to explain how ideologies uh, make social patterns, okay? That's the sort of that's the, the ambition of the project. Um, and so the idea the, is uh, let's think of ideologies as sociocognitive tools. All right. Now let's take a little bit of a detour. Oh yeah, and there's some people who've already begun uh, exploring this. Just for your information, there's a, a pretty um, sort of uh, highly cited, controversial. I don't actually agree with a lot of what happens in this, but there's a it's a um, Target article with a lot of responses by uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett and co-authors on how the sense of should can be explained in terms of active inference and uh, you know sh her favorite stuff is uh, I'm trying to remember the name for this but like there there are systems in your body which measure like uh, levels of nutrients and oh, I forget the name of for it she gets for it but anyways it's trying to minimize a certain forms of uh, internal internally generated. Um, a signal through um, uh, at normative expectations, right? That's the, the, the notion there. So this a biologically based framework for modeling social pressure, the sense of should. And then a recent paper that cites my work, that's why I know about it. <laughs> Remy Tisson uh, at the University of Quebec, Montreal. Uh, he um, uh, has this idea, you know, of how to explain the attribution of propositional attitudes within this and sort of marries uh, Robert Brandom's idea of um, uh, propositional attitudes being a kind of normative statuses with an active inference framework to explain how these normative status, I mean, if you know anything about Brandom, deontic status is an artifact of deontic attitude. So deontic attitudes, 
I feel like I can use this jargon because I'm in Pittsburgh, right? No other place where people know what the hell I'm talking about. But anyway, the, the, the ontic attitudes are somehow implemented through these active infant processes. So some people have, have, have started going in this direction. But um, what I want to finish on is what does this mean for human social cognition and folk psychology more broadly, this approach? Okay, so let me begin with a, 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 rel a brief relevant digression. Here's my advisor again, my former advisor, Andy Clark, and his great uh, book, Surfing Uncertainty. And there's this, there's this uh, apparently tangential, but I think highly relevant debate that's arisen among the predictive processing people. And that is, you know, if you look at Jakob Howey, the, what the uh, results of predictive processing are, are an increasingly accurate model of the underlying causal structure of the distal environment that we um, interact with. Clark says no. Clark says the what predictive processing does is main goal is to make us better agents to act better in the environment. And all we need to do there is track affordances. So this is a familiar concept from ecological psychology. James Gibson, there's an example, the bird flying. It doesn't have to know the truths of aerodynamics. It just needs to track optical flow, which is an affordance. And affordances are essentially relational, right? They're relations between the acting organism and environmental structures. You could call them constructed or enacted because they don't make sense independently of and a particular agent and a way of moving through the, the environment, right? So this raises a question relative to what I'm talking about. And that is humans, you know, just as birds have to worry a lot about flying, for ultra social humans, our main ecological tasks, arguably, uh, you know, and people like Kim Sterelny have made this argument, are social, right? We, you know, what, what water is to fish and, you know, wind currents are to birds, Social dynamics, that, that's the human, that's what it is. Um, that's the most single most important factor in, in our biological success. So what are the social affordances we need to track if we, if we buy Clark's view? So that's, that's sort of a question I wanna keep, I want you to keep in the back of your mind as I bring two other pieces uh, on board. That is two puzzles that have arisen that are sort of obvious puzzles for the predictive processing uh, framework. Number one, by its own lights, by PP's own lights, predictive processing own lights. The folk psychology that predictive processing generates when applied to the social domain is not an accurate model of the relevant causal structures, right? The folk don't think of perception as top-down Bayesian inference of departures from expected sensory stimulations. Uh, they don't think of perception and action as aiming at the same goal. They don't think of expectations as distributions of credences. All of these concepts from predictive processing are highly counterintuitive, that's the point. But that's a bit of a paradox, right? Because if you think what predictive processing does is generate accurate models of the causal structures, uh, relevant causal structures, you would think that predictive processing would generate itself when applied to the social realm. Social realm. But it doesn't, it generates folk psychology. So why, right? And then you could talk about, well, Clark's right, folk psychology is about the affordances, not the deep causal structure. But then we can ask another question. Why do human coordination problems afford folk psychological construals, right? Two, in the most challenging coordination problems at which we excel, we're trying to predict agents who are trying to predict us at the same time. So the thing you're trying to predict is inherently unstable. And that seems like at least the prima facie challenge for especially a Howey type um, predictive processing model. Okay, so here's the punchline, finally there. I think if we think of folk psychology itself as a socio-cognitive tool or an ideology, right? We can solve both, both these problems. The folk psychology generated by predictive processing applied to the social domain is not a model of the causal structure of individual mind brains, it's a set of sociocognitive tools that shape us into better sociocognitive agents and objects. We work to turn each other into better believers, desirers, willers, et cetera, because this makes us easier to interpret and predict by others doing the same, right? So those are the social affordances tracked by predictive processing applied to social domain. They're patterns we find because they're also patterns we make. They're ideologies working as coordination devices. And I'll just end with this slide. When I was 
in port Ireland about to <laughs> about to deliver this talk. I'm walking and as though some kind of, it was like some kind of epiphany. I look in front of me and there's this giant poster I'll believe, and I'm like, yes, that's exactly the point I'm trying to make. Anyway, so uh, thank you very much. And, uh, I just want to give a right. we'll take, uh, uh, a funny break um, to refresh yourself, get some coffee, and then we'll come back for. Uh... I don't think it was showing the poster. It did. I watched. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, that, that's it not. Looks oh, different. Okay. Okay.